So close your eyes and try to picture a hacker. What comes to mind? So here are a list of cliches. Some kid, probably in his 20s, in a dark room staring at a big computer screen with green text trailing on it. And suddenly he breaks into a big important organization, like a global bank or the Pentagon. Now, there are hackers like that who probably look like that and do those kinds of things. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. There's a whole other world of hacking. And it turns out we, the people of Myanmar, are quite the experts at it. We do it all the time. So for those of us who work in technology, we use the word hacking in a different sense than the everyday usage of geeks breaking into computer systems. For us, hacking means solving problems creatively in ways that are often clever and subversive. A hacker is someone who breaks things, tweaks things, and modifies things to extend their functionalities, to make something more useful than it was originally intended to be. So if you spend a lot of time online, you're probably familiar with this idea of what hacking is. So routine shortcuts to a routine household chores are called life hacks. Genius marketing tricks are called growth hacks. And there's even uh, travel hacking, which is uh, trying to get frequent flyer miles in clever ways. There's also sleep hacking, which is uh, trying to get the minimum amount of sleep and getting the maximum rest out of uh, you know, not, not sleeping too much. So these are all buzzwords, but I'd like to bring it back home to a concept that more people will be familiar with. So these 1944 Chevrolet buses were running on Yangon streets for over half a century. I read somewhere that they were originally armored personnel carriers from the Second World War, which were left over. So how did we get these buses to last for so long? So I have a friend who had this brilliant idea once of coming to Myanmar and importing original spare parts for these buses and selling them to car workshops and bus operators in Myanmar. He thought he was going to make a killing because you know, he had all these spare parts that nobody else would want except for people in Myanmar because we still have the buses. Every time he saw one of these buses on the streets, he would blurt out his make and model and you know, remind me that he had so many gearboxes for this bus back in his warehouse. But he went home disappointed. Turns out that for all these old buses, we had swapped out all of their insides. All the uh, buses were just the chassis, that's the only original part. Everything inside it were newer Chinese and Japanese parts. Mechanics in Myanmar had been hacking these buses over the decades, extending their lifespans to way longer than what was originally intended. Now, I'm sure all of you have a similar Myanmar story. Uh, my wife, who is from Singapore, loves to tell this story about how we were planning for a barbecue once. And we just couldn't get the grill to assemble. It was one of those IKEA type things where uh, you're supposed to put it together yourself, but it never works like it says in the instructions. So it was just a few hours before we we're going to start the barbecue. And my wife was really worried because how are we going to have a barbecue if we don't have a functioning grill? Well, the rest of us, being Burmese, were completely relaxed. We knew what to do. We took the whole thing to a nearby car workshop. And the people there got a blowtorch and soldered all the parts together, right on the spot. <laughs> we had a fantastic party after that. We are a nation of hackers. Now the interesting question is, what happens when a nation of hackers suddenly gets connected to the rest of the world with all its newest technologies and trends? I was working and studying abroad until 2014, when I had a great chance to come back home to work with an initiative called Code for Change Myanmar. They were organizing a series of hackathons to get Myanmar's IT community together. So some of you might be wondering, what is a hackathon? Well, a hackathon is like a marathon for hacking. 
So it's an event where you know, techies come together, compete against one another to build prototypes, usually software prototypes, to solve particular problems. It also involves lots of caffeine and not sleeping for some time, uh, just like a real marathon. So the hackers built some really cool apps. And we were fascinated to see the 100 over hackers who came together to build all those apps in the hackathon. This was about the same time in Myanmar when the price of SIM cards were dropping from about $100 each to $1.50. Suddenly, everybody wanted a phone. Over the past one and a half years, the growth rate of mobile penetration in Myanmar has been one of the highest in history. About half the country within the past year have started using phones. Now, the really interesting thing is they're not just using any old type of phone. They were using smartphones. So for those of us who are used to using smartphones, it's easy to forget how the phones that we carry around in our pockets are a stand-in for lots and lots of different devices. Sure, you can make a phone call with your phone, but you can also you know, listen to music, edit videos, take videos, use it as a dictionary, a calculator, a flashlight, um, a GPS navigation device, a health tracker, all kinds of different things. And on top of all that, it connects you to the internet as well. So when people are talking about Myanmar's connectivity revolution, they like to use the words smartphone first, as if it was, uh, fast, uh, it was a surprising thing. But it's really not. If you think about it, you're buying the, a phone for the first time in your life. You can spend about $15 to get a cheap feature phone. All you can do is make calls. Or you can splurge a bit, spend about $30 to $60, and get one of these new phones, which have all these other features built into it. And it also connects you to the internet. And if you're an average Myanmar person, you've never actually even been on the internet. And if you've never been on the internet, it's really quite hard to know what the internet is. In survey after survey, when we ask, you know, have you used the internet in Myanmar? People say no. But they use Facebook. <laughs> they play online games like Clash of Clans. And they use voice apps like Viber. So the internet is just the plumbing that enables all the features that come right, built right into that phone. So the average Myanmar person is well on their way to becoming a digital native. <laughs> but we have to be aware that these technologies are as foreign as they are fascinating. So when people start using first, uh, smartphones for the first time in their lives, they usually use the same apps that all their friends and family are already using. So that means Facebook plays an outsized role in Myanmar, and people think Gmail and email are the same thing. But surprisingly, at the same time, I've seen so many taxi drivers who've never used uh, Google Maps before. And it's surprising that lots of popular social networks, such as Twitter, have very few users in Myanmar. Let me put it this way. We have this culture of hacking in Myanmar, not because we have had a huge amount of choices, but specifically because we only had a few choices. And we had to make the most out of the limited options that we had. So when we're talking about the connectivity revolution in Myanmar, we have to be aware of these barriers that are already in place. So let me illustrate with Facebook. So some things have translated very seamlessly into adoption by Myanmar users. For example, memes. So memes uh, and pages that feature memes in Myanmar have become very popular. And we've always had a sense of wit and satire in Myanmar. And that's one of the reasons why memes have translated uh, so easily in Myanmar. The Myanmar language is changing. So we use shortened versions of words. So we say kui instead of goji, which means 
uh, elder brother, or we say jo instead of jeno, jeno which means uh, when, when a male refers to himself. We're also buying stuff online now. Online shopping takes place also through Facebook. And there's also uh, people using Facebook like a dating site. So I'm sure some of you have gotten requests from random strangers looking for love. <laughs> but if you think that's creepy, that's also a much darker side of Facebook usage in Myanmar. There's hate speech, there's racism, there's discrimination. There's all kinds of other things that reflect that the connectivity just amplifies both the good and the bad in ourselves. So where will all of this lead? I'll present you with two challenges. First, we have to go beyond just Facebook and Gmail. Sure, it's great that we're using Facebook for all these uh, reasons that was unintended, but we have to have our own tech industry. We have to have tech entrepreneurs in Myanmar who are chasing opportunities that are nimble and creative and solve problems based on knowledge of local conditions. And that is already happening. There are dozens of tech startups in Myanmar tackling everything from Craigslist-style listing sites to Uber-style ride-sharing apps. And they face a lot of challenges. Some of them will fail, but that's just how entrepreneurship works. But some of them will succeed, and they will be reaping huge rewards. The second challenge I want to highlight is perhaps more important. We have to be aware that we're not just going through a connectivity revolution. We are in the midst of profound historic changes in this country. Politically, culturally, economically, socially, environmentally. All these changes have been portrayed both as a gold rush and a minefield. I think it's both of those things. And I also think that the connectivity is here. The technology is right in our hands. We might as well use these things to hack our way through these challenges. Let me give one example. So remember those hackathons I was telling you about earlier? We had one just before the elections last year to build apps for people to check who they can vote for, what the parties are, what the voting procedures are. And the app that, the app that won this hackathon was downloaded a quarter of a million times. That's just one example of how we can use technology to tackle civic challenges. There is no going back. We have to become citizens who are empowered by technology. We're still divided in this country along the lines of class, privilege, wealth, language, religion, and all kinds of other things. But we're also hackers who have hacked old buses, we've hacked Facebook, and a million other things to make things more useful to ourselves. Now it's time for us to hack our democracy. Thank you.